Okay, so I make that two o'clock now, or uh, two o'clock in the UK anyway, three o'clock for Oslo and whatever time it is in the world, wherever you are. Um, my name is Clifford Ages, uh, and um, I'm going to talk about a 3D Bionic hand, um, some Xamarin, some IoT. Um, I'm aware that you can probably see the slide full screen, however you've got it set up, and you can probably see a little thumbnail of me. Um, so if you're looking at my screen, I can see a little thumbnail of me up here. Um, what I'm going to do is I can drag that off the screen. Awesome, I didn't know that. Um, you can um, somehow, as a up in the top right corner, I'm told by Dylan, you can make that thumbnail of me bigger. Not because you want to see my nice hairdo uh, or my uh, my shut down beard, but I'm going to be showing lots of hardware um, on video. And the only real way of doing this, obviously, if I, when I did this talk in person, I hand this around uh, the room for people to feel, touch, and play with. Um, it's a bit hard to do remotely, so the only way I can do it is hold it up to the camera and let you see what's there. But that's that's handy, um, or, or one of. I've made so many of them now. But let's get into the talk. What's it all about? Well, a bit about me. Um, as you'll see in that video, um, uh, uh, I'm uh, a pilot for a major UK airline. Um, and when I'm not flying a 787 Dreamline around the world, which is not a lot at the moment, um, Certainly not with uh, with passengers, cardboard boxes. Uh, they're not sure if they want chicken or beef. So, um, you know, it's, it's a bit odd, to say the least. Um, looking forward to getting passengers back on the plane. Um, I'm a .NET developer, uh, mainly Xamarin IoT space because I really enjoy working with mobile and I adore and love playing with electronics. Um, you can probably see behind me uh, my bench with a couple of 3D printers and electronics and cables and wires all over the place. I enjoy learning new things, playing with new tech, new toys, um, cycling and family, wife, uh, three boys, two dogs. Um, so that's that's me. But we're here to talk about Caden. Um, so me, Caden, is a happy-go-lucky uh, turned 16 year old. Um, and uh, you can see there he's, uh, he's an active member of the Scouts and, uh, and the Cubs uh, before that. Um, and he's always, you know, the first to jump forward and try new things out and do do uh, activities when he's at uh, the Jamborees, etc. Those of you that notice in the images there, you can see in the um, the image uh, upright where he's about to jump into the water yet again. Um, you can see he's missing his forearm and his left arm. So he's got a, uh, a small um, part of his forearm from the elbow on, onwards, but most of it is, is missing, um, including his left hand. If you notice on his right hand, you can see in both images, um, he's got a thumb and his, uh, and his pinky. Uh, and the, the, the things in the middle are just basically little nubs, uh, little knuckles, um, and not much else. So he was, you know, um, from birth, you know, he's had those defects, uh, you know, there's a, a few others as well, but they're the, the obvious ones you can see in these images. If you look at the lower image, um, you'll see um, holding his, uh, his hand, he's got a, a claw sticking out. Now that's the claw of uh, the hand that he's given by the NHS, as you can see uh, here. Um, and this claw is basically, there's a strap that goes back across his shoulders onto his other shoulder. And as he pulls his shoulder forwards and backwards, it pulls on the cable, which is effectively a hundred pound fishing line. And it just open and closes the claw. So you can see the fishing line is just pulled and it opens and closes the claw. So that's what he's had um, pretty much since birth. He's had a, an arm of various uh, type or another. So, you know that's what the NHS provides. You can see there he's off to the uh, on the London Underground, going to the uh, the Paralympic Games back in 2012. Um, that's his party trick. He clicks it onto something and walks away from his arm, and everyone's like, "Hold on, that that kid's arms just stayed where it is." Um, so you can see there uh, uh, also in the lower image um, uh, the two versions of the arm. What happens is uh, Roehampton Hospital, which is where his care with the NHS is uh, is mostly done um, every year. Um, pretty much, uh, they they take a, a mould of his uh, of what he has as an arm, and uh, and then from that mould they create uh, a new fiberglass arm, which they then mould, and then the hook part, the part that you can see here, clicked onto the the bar of the underground. This part here just carries over year on year um, until he either breaks it or it's it's too small. So he got a new one a, a couple of years ago, which is why I'm allowed to to keep the one um, that the family have donated me. Um, for making the talks, um, but this part just clicks off. Um, it's jammed in on this arm now, but you can see this this red one is a couple of years old because um, it's this one here. Then you got the green one. He's now got a black one. Um, is the latest one he got uh, a wee while ago. 
as well as handy, which uh, we've 3D printed and produced for him. So you can see there every year these get made and it costs about uh, kind of anywhere between three and five thousand um, pounds, depending on the child and how much work needs to be done um, to, to make the arm. And then the hook um, is about fifteen hundred to two and a half thousand. Again, depending on different adaptions. Um, but the hook carries forward, but the arm is once a year. So it's quite an expense for, uh, for the NHS every year. The National Health Service is what the NHS stands for here in the UK. However, back in uh, uh, just after Christmas in 2016, um, there was a, uh, an article on the news um, uh, here in the UK and I, I guess around the world about a dad that produced uh, a 3D arm um, for, his, uh, for his daughter. Um, and it was all 3D printed. And, uh, you know, my boys went to the same school as Caden, which is how, how we know the family and we're family friends. And uh, when school started back up again in the playground, Caden's uh, mum, uh, asked if I'd, uh, I'd seen these new stories uh, over the Christmas period. And I was like, yeah, I, I have shown. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. You've got a 3D printer, haven't you, Cliff? I was like, yes, I have. And that was where this all started, uh, you know, uh, all those years ago. And the idea was that, um, you know, we'd look at, see if we can 3D print and replicate what his dad did for his, uh, for his daughter. So, um, you know, what can we do? Hold my beer and watch this. I'm hoping this video comes out. Um, I tried playing a video a minute ago. There's not really any sound to go with it. Um, it's just cups clinking around. And hopefully the frame rate is good enough for you to see that Caden is quite dexterous at using his arm. Um, now, he's unusual, I'm told, by his family and his doctors, the fact that because he's used a hook type system like the one he's got now, um, pretty much since he's three or four years old. He's had an arm since birth, um, but the early ones were just dumb arms so he could crawl around the floor. Um, but because he's used it day in, day out, um, for years and years, he's become quite dexterous. He can pick out tea bags, he can, you know, open doors, close doors, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, he's opening the fridge here and, and getting the milk out, that sort of stuff. So he's become very adept at using the hook. And that's the amazing thing about the human body. If you take something away, um, then you adapt. You know, so if you take sight away, your hearing and taste and things like that, your other senses tend to pick up. Um, if you lose an arm or a leg, you adapt to the way you live your life. It's not ideal, it's not perfect, it's not like you know us with two arms and two legs, but you know you learn and adapt. And these tools like these prosthetic arms help you adapt. Because if you imagine him trying to make a cup of tea and he had no arm there, no hook, it'd be you know very, very difficult, a lot more difficult than it is there. So we went from this and it was like, well, what can we do? You know, I went home from school, um, the school run that morning and sat with a cup of coffee in front of my laptop and uh, looked up uh, on the internet and started doing some searching. Now I come across this website. Um, so I started with the NHS, started looking there and come across the, uh, the Lim Limbless Association. Now this website has been um, like this, uh, under development with useful links um, since I started giving this talk about three years ago. Um, so the developers obviously been paid off or has decided that they've done enough work for the amount of money they were given. But at some point, someone's going to finish this page off. Um, maybe they're still working on it. It's going to be an amazing website when it's complete, but um, it's been a couple of years now. So that was no use. The NHS didn't help at all. Um, so a bit more Googling around the, the Sky, BBC News, uh, CNN, all these news companies that carried the story. Um, I eventually found Team Un... Un unlimited uh unbelimited um arm uh this website's obviously moved on um but this is live on the web now um the up to the uh, isabella edition which is as you can see all 3d printed you can see the um they use the, the 100 pound fishing line as well um coming back out to a connector and that connects uh in a similar way across the shoulders to a pad on the other shoulder move it back and forwards and it opens and closes the arm so we took the early design of that, um, which is, um, I hope you can see here, um, this green one here um, that we 3D printed. And that has got the, the spigot here that goes into the end of the arm that Caden had. And we've got a hole there. And at the time, um, there was a bit of uh, fishing line that come out of there and went up and connected to your shoulder. Um, quite proud of printing this. It was like, excellent. You know, it took many, many attempts on my 3D printer then um, to get this to work. Um, hours and hours of 3D printing. Gave it to Caden, he put it on, he tried it, and as you can see here, the fingers go across, but the thumb and finger just barely meet, and they just go like this, um, they just close across, they don't do much else. Um, 
so he's got no control over the speeds um, and the, the how quick they're closed. And the grip there between that finger and the thumb is, you can see there's a slight gap, is pretty weak. Um, so he tried this um, and within a minute or two, he decided that it was it was no good. It, you know, I'll, I'll keep my hook, thanks. Um, you know, I don't like this at all. Um, so I was, well, yeah, okay, fine. I'll go away again, you know, towel between my legs. And I just want to say, it wasn't, you know, said in a malicious um, way. As an airline pilot, we give feedback to each other after every landing, every approach. Uh, we talk about what went when, well, what could have been done better, um, you know, things that, you know, may have, may have been in, improved or things that we thought air traffic control may have told us that, you know, we could have kind of picked up on earlier and worked with or, you know, or that was really good because they told us this and we needed to know that information. So we used to give them feedback. So taking that feedback and Caden, I didn't walk away and say, oh, you know, darn it. Rah, rah. Um, I walked away of, okay, well, I need to do better. Let's see what else we can do. So back to Googling and uh, come across Open Hand Projects, uh, which is um, a, a startup by a guy called Joel Gibbard. And um, this is still there um, as the Open Hand Project. And they had this uh, dexterous hand, which you can see in the image here. So all open source, all on GitHub. So uh, I downloaded the designs and started looking at this, but it wasn't, the designs weren't all there. There was, there was large elements we were missing where they hadn't uploaded the designs um, to, uh, to the website. And um, it was it was okay, but it was it still needed a lot of work um, to get it to a point where it, you know, it'd be complete and able to give it across the Caden. But while I was looking around and, and chatting with people on different forums from around the world, um, I stumbled across Open Bionics. Now, this Open Bionics website has moved on massively. In fact, this has changed in the last couple of weeks. Um, so this video, um, and Open Bionics is again Joel Gibbard and some others uh, in the team, and they've moved on to uh, creating a business, a company that have taken the um, the the arm uh, and the hands, and moved it on to uh, a full prosthetic arm, as you can see in the images in the video. Um, which is um, now for sale. So you can buy these, you can go along to Open Bionics, hand over, um, you know, I'm led to believe it's around £15,000 uh, sterling um, to buy a uh, hero arm. And at the very beginning, when they were first starting out, it was still, it's in the name Open Bionics, it was still open source. So you can go along to their, their GitHub, and you can see here, there's all the files to download the um, the STLs, which is, is uh, what you feed into uh, the software, which then eventually goes to the 3D printer. So you can see there, the, the, I mean, the last commits were well, back in 2018. Uh, and the commits then were literally the molds um, for the hand. So not even the designs of the hand, it was just literally the molds, um, which I'll talk about in a few moments time. But the, the you know, the, the design was there and they've gone kind of close source now and iterate the design from what's, uh, what's here. Um, I'm not going to kind of be negative towards them, you know, they've closed sourced it for a reason. They've turned it into a business. Good luck to them. I hope they do really well. They're helping a lot of people around the world, um, certainly in the US at the moment. Um, you know, it would be nice if they fed back some of that design back into the open source because, you know, there's quite a few um, uh, PRs went in for different designs and there's issues still outstanding, which will never get fixed. Um, I'm led to believe from talking to people um, that the, the reason they went closed source was they're trying to get uh, approval for the NHS and obviously in the US as well. Um, for it to be a medical device and it can't be open source i don't know um but you know that's that's um their their property to do with as they please so we eventually found a design the bruno hand from uh, open bionics which was, which was great so i fired up the printer again and my old um, my old mendel printer um it was tired and worn and it had some issues and it was struggling to print as i say as that green hand took many many hours i was trying to do it a little bit quicker it wasn't brilliant um so what do you do when um, your, your tech isn't up to it? You obviously go and buy a new tech. So I bought a, uh, a printer, um, which is the one you can see there, which is a Prusa uh, Mark III i3. And um, it's got another one just behind me here. Um, and that is an awesome, fantastic printer. At the time I bought this one, they're about 800 pounds sterling. Um, they come in a kit in a box and you can see the instructions um, down here and you put it together. Um, the new one that's behind me was just over £600 sterling and my 10 year old son uh, put that together um, as, a, as a kind of project to show to school that, you know, he's, he's kind of school work from home. I put together a 3D printer and printed off a, a little pug, um, dog, 
Um, so if a 10 year old can put this together with the instructions, that says it's pretty darn easy. It took him about three days to put together, uh, you know, a couple of hours a day. Um, so it's dead easy to put together. Uh, it, it, he can do it and I can do it. Anyone can do it. Just as that good. The reason I've got the red circle is that this blue part here um, should have been black. Um, but when I got the printer, I fitted it wrong and, and damaged, um, I uh, damaged the, uh, the part by getting a, uh, a nut stuck inside and a, 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 um, stripped the thread. Um, so I had to get the old printer out the, uh, out the, um, off the top shelf and print that part. And all I had at the time was some blue filament. So it's printed in blue. It's still there in blue on the printer. Um, and so obviously the old printer's carried forward to the new one um, and, uh, and living there, uh, helping out. So now that I had the printer, I downloaded all the parts, all the STL files, sliced them and printed. All the white components you can see on the desk there are printed in PLA, uh, which is a hard plastic, um, a bit like Lego plastic, um, you know, uh, and the red parts there are flexible parts. If I bring up the hand again, you can see the, uh, the red parts just inside um, between. So they are basically the ligaments. So as the finger bends, they hold it all together. As you can see just in in there so they hold the um the, the the parts together and then the springs go between the finger parts so they pull it back together and uh the motors pull i'm not sure if you can make it out you can just make out the fishing line here um this is um the fishing it's braided fishing line a uh, 100 pound braided fishing line um which is lighter weight and it's flexible unlike the plastic that was used before and so a motor is inside the motor pushes down you can see the uh, actuonic motors just here the motors push down and as they push down they pull the string and as they pull the string uh, or the fishing line it pulls the finger over and bends it down and then when the motors motors back the springs pull the fingers back into place just like you see it spring up just there so it's a fairly simple mechanical design obviously a lot of time and effort has gone into that design um but the four motors here sit in the four little trays here and this one here actuates the uh, the thumb as well to pose the thumb across so all the plastic parts, the motors, the, the little uh, brass bushes, what they do is they push into, you melt them in, put them on the end of a solder nine and push them into the plastic. So that hole there, um, that you can see just where my mouse pointer is, uh, it's got a three mil brass insert that goes in and it gives you a nice threaded uh, machine thread. So you can use machine screws just like here um, to push into rather than using self-tapping if you undo them and push them back in again. Uh, after a couple of turns, they're, they're damaged and can't be used anymore. So all those parts are uh, purchased and uh, have them and uh, use them. So now we had the hand built. Now we're thinking, how do we connect this to Caden? Uh, while we were working on getting the hand built, um, you know, I started 3D printing a socket. So what we did was we took a mold of Caden's arm. They used some air drying clay and, um, and took the mold that uh, the hospital had used um, for his previous arm. And uh, my eldest son um, is a bit of a dab hand with, uh, with Blender and uh, 3D Max and basically three, drew in the 3D uh, space, uh, hand-drawn, um, the, the socket that you see printing there. Um, and, you know, uh, looking there, it's five hours and 45 minutes remaining. It's quite late in the evening. I went to bed, expecting to come down in the morning to, to find a nice socket to try. Uh, but it's 3D printing. I come down to, uh, to an almost completed socket and a bit of a spider's web mess. Uh, what had happened is, uh, if you look back at the video, you see it starting to lift off the bed. Um, it popped off the bed, fell to the back out of the way, thankfully, rather than jamming up the, uh, the uh, y-axis of the bed. And it carried on printing into free space, which is why you got the mess. But thankfully, it printed enough, just enough, for us to try it on Caden. So you can see there, that's his elbow, fits inside there. And you can see the socket and the end of his, uh, the stub of his arm um, is down there. And all we wanted to do was get from his arm to a flat surface on the end so that we could then mount something to go uh, an arm between him and where the hand needs to be. So obviously we don't want the hand up here, we want it to be uh, the, the natural crack then. Um, I realized what I'd been doing was the build bed here, because I was printing in PLA, needed some um, some glue stick on it. Um, and like the glass bed where I could put painter's tape on it, um, this needed a glue stick, slightly different uh, way of doing things with Perusa. Um, I hadn't read the manual, being a bloke, that's, you know, we don't read the manuals that well, do we? Um, so I printed another one, but we had this once we tried it on Caden, it was too small. So we printed another one and uh, it was too big. So just like Goldilocks, we printed a third and it was just right. And uh, there's Caden trying on uh, V3 version three. And um, 
and you can see that it's given us a nice flat surface on the bottom that we can mount things to and build off to give him an arm to go through to his hand. So now we've connected Caden and we've got something to, to connect to the hand. So that's the mechanical side out of the way. Um, obviously, a big part of this is cost. We don't want to be as expensive as the NHS, you know, three, four, five thousand per year. We don't want to be um, upwards of, you know, uh, 80 to 120,000 for a full prosthetic arm uh, being made out of carbon fiber with all sorts of electronics inside. Um, uh, you know, open bionics send these for around 15, I believe. Um, you know, I want to get this down to a price point where I can stick it in a box with a 3D printer and fly it somewhere in the world uh, and go and um, give it to a, um, a hospital with technicians, show them how to use it and let them build them locally for the, for children. Um, and also help people out, you know, if anyone knows anyone that needs an arm, then, you know, reach out to me. So the hand parts here, we use a PLA plastic. It's about 22 uh, pounds sterling per kilo. And if you look up all the grams used, we're spending about five pounds to make all those white components. The red ligament parts, the flexible filament is a bit more expensive. It's actually gone up in price and that's about 30 pound a kilo now. Um, but we're only using 20 pence and we can make, you know, hundreds um, uh, of the ligaments. You can get about, give or take a bit, about kind of, you know, um, what, around kind of four hands-ish out of the uh, out of a, a spool of filament for the um, uh, the hand parts. And then the moulds, um, they use a slightly different material, PETG. And uh, what they do is, and the moulds here, so this is the one for the palm. So if you look at the palm, um, you see this black here, this is the, um, if you used to make this out of Lego plastic, Lego plastic is quite slippery, you can't grip stuff, so this is a uh, urethrine rubber, it's a bit like kind of like a neoprene rubber, it's kind of the same sort of thing that your mouse mat's kind of made of, that sort of stuff, um, and it's quite a, a bit squashy, so you can grip things without breaking them, but it's also got quite a nice grip to it. So what you do is once you've 3D printed the parts, you stick them into the mould, you screw the flat plate down, and then in it comes out, it does. You fill the little reservoir here with um, the urethrin 30 rubber, and then you push down and it squirts the rubber in around the mold and it starts to come out these little air holes. You just leave it on the shelf for, you know, 24 hours, take the screws out, pull it off, you know, just clean up a little bit. Um, it takes a few minutes to just clean off the, the flashing around the edge and uh, you're good to go. This mold here for the palm and there's one for the fingers and there's one for the thumb. I've used that. I've done one print and I've used that. I've probably made seven or eight of these hands now, if not more. And every time I just use the same mold. So that may be £10, but that £10 is usable, you know, umpteen times. As long as you're careful and don't break it, you can just keep using it again and again. So really, the cost, the first one carries that cost of £10, but the others are just costing kind of, what, £5 um, without the molds. Um, yeah, £5.13. Um, and that's all the cost of the mechanical parts. The screws, nuts, bolts, and springs that go on top is about another kind of... Uh, 80 to 90 pounds at the moment and uh, the motors are quite expensive they're about 80 pounds at the moment the price has gone up because of the dollar rate to sterling um, and they're made in the us um, uh, the motors so then we get on to the control so the control of the uh, the boards is open bionics have a, uh, a board that they at the time sold they no longer have a store um, but I had a board which is based an arduino board and they called it the chestnut and uh, the four motors connect to it and there's a bit of power going in and an Arduino or so uh, AVR microcontroller in the center, um, which done the control. Um, they purpose built the, and designed this board and uh, produced them and they sold them on their store for 250 plus VAT uh, uh, plus post and packaging. So the best part, 300 pounds. Um, but, you know, I waited many months to try and get one and it was quite difficult. So, you know, getting a board was, was a challenge. Um, they also used these um, these little connectors which are it's gone there it is um and these as you can see an image here these are what they use to uh sense the muscle movements so they're just um just little boards you can see in the image um by myoware and they have the little sticky pads on just like you have when you go for an ecg and uh, you need three pads for each board you need two of these boards because you need to sense both muscles uh, in the arm so you need six of these pads so you place the boards um, on the muscle and you need to be center of the muscle mass for the two main sticky pads. 
And then the third sticky pad needs to go on to uh, myotendon junction, which is basically anywhere there's no, no muscle. So a bone or the end of the muscle group. And that is basically your null point. And then you measure across those two compared to the null point, And it gives you a, a sense of reading. But you need to be sent to the muscle mass. If you're even slightly off, you can see um, the midline offset and the intervention zone. Um, you don't really get that good of a signal. So you need to place them correctly. Uh, and, you know, this is for a child. Um, so we need to make sure that, you know, an adult's doing this. Um, not scale, that's not my muscles. Um, I've not been to the gym recently, so uh, muscles are nowhere near as big as that. Um, but you can see, you know, the board needs to be stuck on um, to the skin. Um, now imagine sticking an electronics board. These are about £35 each. Um, you need two of them, so that's £70. Um, and you need to stick them to a child with sticky pads. Um, and the sticky pads cost, um, you get 50 for £5. So you need six per day. They're going to last you about a week, a pack. So that's five pound a week. Um, and, you know, you're sticking an electronic board. This one I can swing around because it's already been cracked and broken, um, the boards. So, you know, a kid's going to break that pretty darn quick. I mean, I, I break it pretty quick and I'm an adult. Um, well, I'm adult size, child in mind. So how does it, how do we connect that little board to uh, to Caden? How, how do we connect it to a child? You know, the sensors, you can see there, you've got uh, inside forearm and outside forearms where you need to stick the board. So this is where, uh, hopefully, I haven't got a video screen watching you all, but hopefully you're, uh, you've all got a, um, uh, your arm and you've got your hands. If you put your fingers, just make a little claw grip here and put it either side of your, your, your um, just above your elbow um, with your wrist swaps and that. You then open, as, so your hand away from you, you'll feel the outside forearm muscle go tense and the inside forearm won't go tense. If you close, the inside forearm goes tense and the outside forearm uh, goes slack. If you hold your hand upright and grip, both muscles go tense. So we've got open, we've got close, and then you grip, it goes tense. So that is open the hand, close the hand, and the grip is to change the next grip in the grip sequence. So you can see there that we've not got a way of controlling this. And open Bionix, you know, as you can see the logos there, it's their design and, uh, you know, taking that and built on it so you can see there we've now got a way of uh, opening and closing the grips and changing the next grip open bionics uh code uh has five grips in the grip sequence you got fist grip um you got the palm grip carrying the shopping caden asked me to remove that because he doesn't want to help with the shopping um you got the tripod grip for holding the pencil um pinch grip or okay grip uh, and then you got the point gesture it's over there um when you're pointing to your friends um You've got five grips in the grip sequence. You need to remember every time you clench your fist um, and tense both muscles, um, you're going to the next grip in the grip sequence. So that's, you know, you've got to remember where you are in the sequence, um, you know, what you're trying to, uh, you know, uh, achieve. I'm going for the fist grip and I'll point to my mate that, you know, it's over there or, you know, um, the person I'm looking for is over there. So I've got to go one, two, I'm at a point just excellent, that works. Um, and now I've got to uh, kind of, Open, so close the grip because I want it to close and action it. It's a lot of them. Now we will adapt just like any child would. But remember when you are on a grip sequence, you know, if you haven't done anything with your arm for five minutes, you've got to kind of remember what state your hand's in. Um, for us, it's quite easy. We just, you know, think I want my hands closed and it just does it. Um, Caden needs to build that kind of muscle memory up, but he needs to remember where he is in the grip sequence. We don't need to think like that. We can just do it and the hand moves to that position. So this was, yeah, it's okay. Uh, how does it work inside the codes inside the Arduino software that's loaded into um, into the uh, into the chestnut board? Um, it, they call it beetroot um, as their code base. Um, there's a grip array. Now those five grips are there. Um, there's six here because there's an extra one been loaded in the code. Um, but you can see that um, it's basically a three D um, uh, 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 array. And uh, what happens is if I zoom in. Um, you can see there's 0 to 100, so we take the thumb grip, and uh, what happens is there's an animation timer that runs for um, for two seconds, and over that two seconds, it, it counts from 0 to 100, and then you've got the different fingers. So you've got uh, a finger with thumb is F0, that's your uh, index, your, your middle finger, and then three and four are tied together. Um, I think this is when they were thinking about trying to put five motors in, but then realised quite quickly that we do we very rarely move these fingers independently. Um, to the point where some people can't move them that well independently, I can't. Um, so the, 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 the two smaller fingers just move together under one motor. 
Um, it made the design cheaper, easier to build, and weren't trying to squeeze extra motor in. So as it times up over the two seconds from 0 to 100, it starts out with the fingers in this position. So as it gets to zero, if you're doing the thumb, the thumb will be fully open and the other fingers will fully close. Um, and that will give you um, a thumb. And as it moves from that, this position or whatever position it's in to fully open or fully close, we look down to the pinch grip, which is further down. As it times up, uh, it gets to position 10. It says to the thumb, well, you're fully open. I want you to move to 700, which is three quarters closed because it's um it's not to a thousand um so three quarters closed and then i want to do nothing blank with the the other fingers and then when we get to 100 make sure that those fingers are fully uh closed fully open fully open fully open so those fingers don't move and then just finish off by closing the thumb a little bit more going to 750 and that gives you the pinch grip or the okay so i've explained that to you we're all software engineers we could all probably add on a seventh grip you know, give it a few minutes, you could probably work it out and think about it, um, but we're software engineers. We could add an array. We know that we need to put the comma and the curly braces and everything else, and we need to put it together. And then you need to have the Arduino IDE loaded onto your laptop, which is not, uh, uh, you know, it's a fairly simple bit of software, but it's a bit tricky. If you've done IoT work to get it to work, um, it's basically notepads with a few extra bits on it. Um, it's not a brilliant IDE. Um, or you can use Visual Studio, uh, or sorry, VS Code, um, which uses the IDE underneath and it gives you a slightly nicer um, feeling. Or you can use full fat um, Visual Studio VS19. And there's an add-in which I'll talk about later called VS Micro, which allows you to do it in Visual Studio. But you can do this. And then you can plug a cable into the board and you can download the code um, once you've compiled it down to the board and reconnect the board and the wires and, and then put it back into hand, reconnect it all up and then test out that new grip. But we're software engineers, we can do that. Um, you know, some people might be scared of playing with electronics, but you know, it's only 3.3 .3 volts, um, it, it's not even gonna tiggle. Um, but how would that be for a child, parents that want to add a grip or take a grip out because they don't really ever use the point grip or the palm grip, um, and they wanna put an Xbox grip in, um, for example. Um, it's not easy, you know, how's this gonna work for you know, doctors and nurses and technicians in a hospital? where they don't have a laptop that's capable of running Visual Studio or VS Code or the Arduino software. Um, you know, it's not easy. So I didn't like that at all. So I've covered a few drawbacks and I've talked about this project a bit negatively, but that's because I want to talk about what we've done to improve on it. So processor, it's single source supplier um, and it's expensive and I couldn't actually get it from OpenBiotics. I tried for a few months and never managed to buy one. Um, and the MyWare sensors and uh, the sticky pads and then the grips and the grip sequence, we want our own personal grip. It wasn't ideal. So I wanted to come out and uh, get across those drawbacks as we moved on. Because we can get the boards, I use a lot of uh, boards from Adafruit. And um, they bought out the feather boards um, a couple of years ago. And one of the ones I bought out was this feather M0 um, blue fruit. And it's got the uh, SAM, uh, the 21 Atmel chip uh, is running this. And then this kind of board, the red board here is a Bluetooth um, connector, which is all wired in, and you've got a, uh, a, a J JST plug here for plugging a battery in, and a USB um, plug there for plugging in your um, your cable to your, your um, laptop to, uh, to connect up and program. This board here is, uh, I think it's around 20 pounds at the time. Um, so, you know, I could get it from Amazon. Um, I did this talk at NDC uh, last year, and a couple of days before, uh, I accidentally connected the battery where I still had the USB plugged in, and it's a new board, and I didn't have underneath there's a little uh, um, pad where you, you cut the, between the two, so you can't draw power from both. Um, I hadn't cut that, tried to draw power from both and burnt the board out. Um, I ordered a new part from Amazon, and it arrived the next day, so the talk was saved. But that meant that they're easily available. I'm not waiting for you know a bespoke board to be built for me. And you know they're light as a feather, apparently a large feather. Um, you look at the uh, the specs; it, it, you know it's light. It's got um, almost the same chipset as the uh, OpenVionics one, um, and it's got all the pins and and you know uh, pulse width modulation pins and analog inputs and outputs. Um, it had everything we needed, except had no EEPROM, uh, which did come back and bite me. But there's ways around that. So I got the boards. I also got from Adafruit. Um, they have uh, the feather range. They're basically all stackable, just like Raspberry Pis uh, with hoods. 
Um, and this board here, this second board is the motor controller board. So that will control um, up to four motors or two servos. And uh, you can see them, we only needed four motors. So we connected that up and it connects to the main board using uh, a serial communications uh, I squared C, um, which communicates backwards and forwards um, between the main board and uh, my control board, which meant I didn't need those uh, pulse width modulation uh, signals. Um, so they weren't used at all. So um, it also had analog inputs. Um, you can see there A1 through A5, which control the muscle sensors that we eventually used. So that was great. Um, one problem I had was the, the motor boards, the cable connectors, the flat ribbon cable that comes off the motor um, doesn't really connect to the, uh, the, the through, through pins. So that was uh, a challenge that was to, to overcome, but not too difficult. But you can see here, I managed to put it together. In the end, I found some connectors, used some extra flat ribbon cable to go through the through hole, and I did some soldering um, and, uh, and improved on that. You can see the, the, the mess that's left. Um, you see there, I put a circle around the pull loop boards, which is a, uh, a voltage regulator board. And what I've done there is this connector here, I plug 12 volts into, and 12 volts comes down to power the motors, because the motors are 12 volt DC. And I take that 12 volt signal, as you can see also, into this Polaloo step down board, and that steps it down to 3.3 volts, which is what the, uh, the, the controllers on the two main boards use for doing the control signal um, and, and controlling uh, the microprocessors. So that board there is only a few pounds, and it means that I have one supply into the hand from the, from the arm and the battery stuff in the arm through to the hand. I have one connector. Um, which takes that power through and it's just 12 volt DC. Um, you can see there's connected up on the bottom. So that means we've crossed off the processor. We found a way of controlling it. And instead of being 200 pound plus VAT plus postman package, those two boards and bits and bobs, you know, we're talking less than kind of 50 pounds uh, is required um, to get those in. So next on to the sensors, the MyWare sensors. Now, as I say, I fly planes around the world and I like reading magazines when we're up on the cruise. There's not much to do. You know, you know, I'm a systems engineer at the end of the day computers flying in close formation um you know so we read magazines newspapers and stuff uh, in between interacting with the aircraft we're still flying the plane don't get me wrong don't panic and worry that we're sitting there with a big board sheet in front of us um we're still at the kind of eyes watching the instruments and that but you can scan read a um a magazine or newspaper quite happily um obviously don't put it in front of you um but i like reading hackspace it's a awesome magazine highly recommend it if you want to get into iot um, it's got you know beginner to advanced stuff in there all the time. So I was reading this one, which was April 19, about Arduino debugging. You know, I use Arduino. I was like, well, you, know, you can always learn, even though you think you know, you can always learn something new. And the bit I learned from this wasn't the debugging part, even though there were some a few uh, tips and tricks in there. It was this sensor? Um, this is a um, a, uh, um, a, a little uh, sensor, um, which if you uh, knock or bash the sensor, um, it's a piezoelectric sensor. Um, so a bit like uh, you supply voltage to a piezoelectric buzzer, um, which is in your PC, it buzzes, and you know, four buzzes is, I oh, can't remember now, is it memory or something? I can't remember. Um, but this one, if you give it vibration or a knock, it will supply micro voltage out, and you can measure that on the uh, on the Arduino board um, analog input. Um, and they use these in guitar pickups uh, for electric guitars. They use these uh, mostly in demolition, so they'll put them around the building to measure the, the pressure waves that come out the, uh, the sensors. Um, and decide whether they 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 you know blew the building up correctly is uh, where apparently the cycle says they use magic. They um, put that in there before I moved on. Um, so we fit that to Caden's arm and uh, put it in, and he sort of said straight away that the difference between that and the MyWare sensor is the fact that the MyWare sensor he could control the grip, he could stop pushing on the pad, and the hand stops, um, and then he can continue. So he had a bit more flexibility as to what the hand did. Uh, with these sensors, because it was just you only got a, a, a kind of a spike, which you measured if you went above a threshold, um, trigger that movement. It once you started the open or close, it went all the way open, always close. So it couldn't stop halfway through. So it was okay. Um, you know, I landed, I think it was in Japan, I landed, um, and I bought a pack of these for a pound from Amazon. Um, they're made in China, so they flew, they got them from China to the UK and delivered to my house for a pack of 10 for one pound. Um, I'm not sure how the economics of that work, um, but hey, um, you know, they, they work great. But Caden didn't like them. He, he was like, can we not go back to the old sensor? It was better. Um, so I went back to the drawing board, had some more ideas, and I come across full sensitive resistors. Um, as you can see there in the, in the little GIF, uh, as you apply pressure, the more pressure you apply, um, you can see that in the tenseness of the fingers. 
um, the the uh, the more the voltage out changes. And because it's full sense resistor, you just create a resistor bridge. And depending on what you bridge it with, depends on uh, how quick that ramps up and ramps down as you apply the pressure. Um, so we've got a couple of these. These were £6 for a pack of two. Um, they work fantastic. Um, we realised quite early on after fitting them um, that this sense area um, is quite small, as you can see there with a the finger and thumb. Um, and Caden needed a bit more sense area to sense the muscle. So we bought the slightly bigger rectangular ones, which are £6 each. Um, but still only twelve pounds, and um, delivered from Amazon as well, or any you know Spark Fund, any electronics place, um, and they work brilliantly. So here's the uh, the wiring diagram from Fritzin. Uh, I've left it in, you know intentionally a little bit messy, um, but just to show you the fact that we have you know analog going down to our two uh, force sensitive resistors, some uh, power going out to our motors. Um, the blue lines are um, are the uh, analog signals and the red and black lines are, are plus and minus uh, voltages. Um, we've got here a 1300 milliamp hour battery and um, that's just the only one that Fritzin has. Um, I'm using a 10,000 milliamp uh, hour anchor power brick. Now um, Open Bionics use a 14.7 volt um, uh, power bank out of a, an RC car um, so it's a big chunky battery um, that goes in which is why when you see in the videos they have a big chunky part that comes out. Um, the, Problem with that is a fairly hefty battery, although it's on an elbow uh, position, you're not actually carrying much of the weight, the shoulder's doing the lifting. But the problem with that is you need a specialist power supply to charge it up, you know. Um, it's not that easy. This is USB. Um, this was £20 from Amazon. Um, you can get cheaper ones, 10,000 milliamp hours. It's more than enough to charge the arm and run the arm for a couple of days. Um, but it's only five volt output. That board I told you about earlier, that step down board that Poly make, they go from 12 volts down to 3.3. They also make another board which goes from 5 volts up to 12 volts. And again, it's only a few pounds, so I bought a few of those. Um, and the current rating of the motors, if all motors moved together, was higher than what this board can carry. Plus, we obviously sort of uh, powering the, the controller boards as well. But because um, it was only one amp above what that board could supply because we're only doing the, the fingers for a short period of time um it's not burnt the board out i thought it would but obviously they've got a safety rating inside on their data sheet um i looked into the current i've measured the current that's being drawn it's not as much as what the motor said they were um so actually this board is you know it's been in caden's arm and in my test hand here for for quite a period of time and uh, there's been no issues with it at all um here's here's one just there you can see um connected up so that's what we've used uh, and it works brilliantly which means we've now got a power brick which means you can have a spare one in your backpack when he goes to school or when he did go to school um the only downside is that his friends like to uh, charge their mobile phones um and he has to make a decision whether he powers his arm or he powers his uh, his uh, android phone or his iphone um so you know kids will be kids um but there you go so we've now covered off the myware sensors we've got these four sensor resistors and just leaves a grip sequence now so as I said at the beginning, I'm a freelance.net developer. I spend a lot of time playing with uh, with uh, IoT and electronics. I do a lot of mobile development um, with Xamarin. And uh, the Bluetooth uh, sensor uh, in your mobile phone was more than enough to connect to um, the, the Adafruit Bluetooth board. There's lots of, you know, I put this slide together with a lo load of, um, you know, um, images uh, and icons of, of what Bluetooth there is. It's basically two versions. You've got Bluetooth Classic, which is what, powers your, your headphones and, and powers you know something really near constant data stream and you've got bluetooth low energy which is where it's just a little bit of data back and forth we need to send a, you know a small packet of data every now and again so bluetooth le which means we're not using as much power and the way that works is you have your central device your phone your tablet your computer um, and then you have your peripheral device which is you know your your watch handy maybe the stereo in your in your uh, in your car um, you know, whatever it is, is your peripheral device. And the way that works is the fact that at the very beginning, um, the, I think this, it, I thought it expanded, it doesn't. Um, the communications at the beginning is they set up um, a, a, a connection interval and then um, the master and slave, it's still called master and slave, even given, you know, what's going on in the world at the moment, these hopefully will get changed, but that's what uh, it's called in the Bluetooth spec, is master and slave. Um, the master sends a request and the slave responds and then they go to sleep for a period of time because that period there is not very good in this graphic and maybe I should redraw it. 
Um, that period there may be a, a few milliseconds before they've agreed the connection interview, master sends a response again, slave response, and then they go to sleep again. And because that sleep period can be made longer and longer and longer, you can save quite a lot of battery, hence the blue chief of energy. Inside that, it's just like a class inside your um, C Sharp project. You have a profile, a service, and characteristics. So that's your class, your your um, your method inside that, and uh, and then the characteristics that will be your properties um, that are inside your uh, your service. So to get to the the heart rate on on my Garmin watch here, it will be inside the heart rate service, and there'll be one for the heart rate that's that's now, one for the heart rate that's over the last twenty four hours. That sort of thing is the way that works. So if we now go out to um, the Bluetooth. Um, this is the uh, Openbionics um, software um, that's downloaded from GitHub. I've heavily modified this now, and it's on my GitHub repo, which will stay open source um, with all these modifications. I've added Bluetooth um, library to it, and I've heavily modified the other parts, including the grip sequences, um, etc. And uh, obviously put in a Bluetooth um, and uh, Adafruit motor shields, etc. But to set up the Bluetooth, uh, Adafruit um, produce libraries for the boards they make. So you pull in their libraries, and then you basically set it up. Um, you you know set up a flag that's it disabled, and then you do a factory reset. I do that every startup just to make sure there's nothing left over in memory, and also why I've been testing just to make sure that uh, anything I've set that's been a bit unusual um, will get wiped out of memory. Um, give it a device name. No being name it appears in the list when you do a Bluetooth search. Um, and then you just sit there and wait for it to connect and uh, turn off the echo. And the Bluetooth uh, inside the board will start trying to connect. Um, it'll only it'll time out after uh, 10 seconds, and that's just because you don't want to waste the battery. Um, and then when it's connected, uh, we set a minimum firmware version of the board because we're using some of the newer stuff um, inside the library. So we need to make sure we're above that version number of uh, uh, 0.6.6. Um, and then after that, once it's enabled, we just pull the Bluetooth, um, which is all we're doing here. We're just pulling the Bluetooth every time we come around the uh, the, the uh, sequence inside the Adafruit so inside the Arduino software. And then these here are just overrides. Um, these parts here are just overrides of um, you know console dot write line or debug dot write line. Um, and when uh, OpenBionics put the code together, they have. A, um, a bit of debug software um, in one of the uh, files, which allows them to send serial commands to the hand when it's plugged into um, a laptop, so they can kind of you know just check and make sure that the sensors are working, that sort of thing. I've added to that long list um, my own commands and uh, and got them just printing. So I've hijacked that, sent it going via the serial port. I send it via the Bluetooth and send it out to this library. That's all I need to do to get the Bluetooth to work. And, uh, and obviously heavily modifying the other parts. So that gets us to Bluetooth. Now to the mobile app. So now I, what I did was connect that. Uh, um, Adafruit have a uh, an app you can download and install, which allows you to um, to uh, send Bluetooth commands back to boards over um, uh, UART, which is a um, seal uh, protocol. Um, and I could test and move the hand around. So I was over the moon. Excellent. I've got control. Now let's build an app. I said at the beginning I use Xamarin. Um, uh, I do a lot of Xamarin development. The good thing about that is Android, iOS, UWP, Tizen, Mac OS. It's across all the platforms. Um, I know C Sharp, .NET developer, which means I know how to program it because it's just .NET. Um, and it has accessibility built in, which is quite an important feature because I wanted to be able to, Caden has his font bigger um, than the URI I had because he's got less fingers to pods to screen with. Um, he has uh, you know, different things set up in the accessibility of his phone um, that we wouldn't have set up. And you know, the next child may have theirs set up in a completely different way. I wanted it to be such that if they set it up, um, you know, their screen in a different way, it made the buttons bigger. It made the text bigger. It did the you know, um, uh, text to speech, that sort of thing, without me having to program it into my app. And that's part of the OS. It's not Xamarin, that's the OS that does that. So um, I chose Xamarin. Um, initially went with Android and, uh, and Apple because they were the main ones. I've also got a, a UWP version I'm putting together at the moment, so it can be used on tablets and uh, laptops in the hospital as well. Two versions of, or uh, two flavors of Xamarin. You've got traditional, which is where all your back end stuff is written in C Sharp, and then your, your um, UI layer is written in, um, you know, in the uh, native languages. 
um, the XAMLs and the uh, Java's and Objective C, that sort of thing. Um, and you store your boards, uh, it's all written in the um, UI layer. But you've got the Xamarin forms where it's shared um, and you write it in a Xamarin version of XAML, um, which is different to WPF, is different to UWP. Um, I've got a talk tomorrow morning if you want to learn about how to, uh, to uh, do this. Um, beginners, um, how to go from file new to an app that runs on your phone tomorrow morning. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about how this works. But basically, you write your XAML, your C Sharp backend, a bit of MVVM between the two, and uh, you've got an app um, that you can install on your phone. So if we go across to um, the handy app, um, the first thing we need to do was uh, the Bluetooth. Um, you remember I talked about that model where you have a service uh, and uh, you had your little profiles inside them. Uh, that's a service GUID, so it has a GUID. Uh, thankfully, Dylan didn't use them all up this morning, so we've still got some GUIDs to use in the world. Uh, and then there's a read and write GUID, so it's a single uh, pipe um, for read and write, and then the GUIDs for this. And then basically we just connect, um, and we just have a, um, a service that connects, and it creates a... Um, a uh, um, the service creates a, the, sorry the, the library that you install, um, which is from ACR um, or, or plugin is a Bluetooth. Um, just gives you um, events, so it's all event based. Uh, as a new um, message arrives, it sends it out, or as it sees one that's arrived in, it reads it in, and then gives you that as a string, um, which you can then use to control um, the hand. So if we want to send the string out. We just send it the bytes. It has to be in ASCII. So you convert it to ASCII and write the bytes out. And uh, it's literally just, you write it out and you've no way of knowing that you got there other than the hand sends a response, which you can read back in and uh, read back into, uh, into a string. And you convert it back from um, the, um, the ASCII format into a string format with C sharp. That's it, it's pretty darn simple. Um, however, the clever thing about um, um, this app as well was when I started writing it shell was a fairly new thing that come out of, uh, of Xamarin and um, so I've used shell here to to build the layer um, the UI is more because I want to learn about how to use shell I've used it in a couple of live projects now as well as this one and it means that we can um, you don't need to worry about the navigation stack um, it's all done for you um, it, it's all put together and sorted out for you now hopefully if I click and you see this is my phone and I go and grab visor um, I do across, and um, that should be this is my phone that's sitting in front of me. And I grab this is the exciting bit where hopefully everything works. And the demo gods have been paid their dues, and I'm not going to get into any smoke things going wrong. Um, it's just doing the builds. Um, what I've done is I've deleted the app from the phone and uh, done a clean build of this. And the reason for that, I should have actually done a build um, beforehand, is because I want you to see the fact that um, when you use Xamarin, and normally when you open up a new app, it says, oh, give permission to use GPS, that sort of thing. Um, I want you to see the fact that um, that is all part of Xamarin. So Xamarin will, uh, using Xamarin Essentials, um, when it says, oh, I want to use Bluetooth on Android, it says, oh, you need to give permission. And it allows you to give permissions for always or just when you're using the app. Um, so it's taking uh, a little bit longer than I thought it was going to take to build. Um, should push to my phone soon. Um, you can see it's raining here uh, where I live in uh, Shepparton in West London. Um, so come on. Should pop up soon. So there's just a picture of Handy. And... Uh, Across in the center and um, so it's not connected so please connect first so this is where we plug the battery in and we would see and connect that first and click start scanning and this is where it says only when we're using the app that was the um, thing and we clicked on handy there I did it quick because remember we had that 10 second timer and the reason is it only um, we've only got it doing the Bluetooth stuff on startup of, of turning the hand on and the reason for that is we realized that actually it was just drawing battery power if his phone wasn't in use. Um, so we just do it on boot up of the, the hand. Um, so now if we go into the UART control, which I mentioned earlier, uh, we should see this coming in. Right to the back, it is connected on Bluetooth. And um, that's where we send commands to and from the hand. So we can send uh, commands down to the hand 
or we can go back to the grip selection. And again, all this navigation um, and menu navigation and flyout menus that happen is all part of Shell and it's done for me. Um, so now if I click the fist grip, it's centered down. Actually, I think I messed that up a little bit. So if I just close that down and open it up again, like I said, the demo gods. IoT, you have to be, you have to give them something extra. I don't know what it is, but uh, it seems to work first time. There we go, it's working this time. Um, and this is, these are all the commands that I talked about earlier that OpenBionics have, which use the serial port. And uh, this is just uh, me just pushing them out as they would to a serial monitor on a laptop. Um, I've added lots and lots and lots of extra ones in here. So getting all the, the, the data from the, the monitors, um, extra commands in there for doing things. Um, a lot of those have been added um, uh, by me. So now if we go back to the grip selection, hopefully this is where the magic happens. Um, this should be an animated GIF, um, but there seems to be a problem with animated GIFs in, uh, in Xamarin at the moment, in the latest build. This was working before, but it's now broken, so I'm not sure what that is, but they, the hook grip, it should show the animation of the grip coming across. These are massive buttons, and the idea is that the massive buttons are so Caden can, uh, can Pods them with his fingers. Um, and then there's a heart up in the top. He can select that and say, I'm favoriting that, put that into my favorites list. Um, and then we've got all the, uh, these here. So now if I go along, um, it's not working on my screen, so I'll use my finger down on the phone. And if I push the grip, we should see that the grip opens and closes by pushing the button. I can go to the hook grip and we'll do the hook grip and um, Go along to the point grip and it's over there is the way to the coffee machine um so you can see there we've got all these grips loaded so you can see it gives the messages at the bottom I'm not sure if you can hear this there's a, a bit of a whine um i'm going to just turn that off and the reason for that whine is that's just a pwm signal being sent on the motors i've got it set that low um so it's audible to us you'd set it a lot higher but i've got two dogs in the house and i realized uh, fairly early on that why i had the uh, the signal set out of our audible range as humans above 20,000 kilohertz, um, the dogs could hear it and it sent them nuts. It took me weeks to realize why the dogs were going bonkers every time I was playing with the handy. Um, so I put it back into our audible range. Um, I leave the motors running between uh, comms on my test device here because I'm gathering data uh, inside the memory of, of other things that are going on. On Cadence 1, as soon as the action is finished, a second or so later, the motors turn off and it goes silent. Um, but on this one, it's not. Um, if I then go into, say, the grip order, so he selected, he's favorited his grips in the grip order, and in the selection, you can see there, um, there's the grips, um, but that's not the order, he wants the hook to be first, so if we drag that one up there, and we actually, we want that one up there, and uh, actually we want pinch to be second, not that one, so I'm just wielding the list here, again, these should be animating, um, showing you what that actually is doing, and then you click save, uh, new grip order is saved. That would now be sent to the phone, uh, sent to Handy next time Handy connects, um, and that will be the new grip order um, that's sent across. Um, what if he wants to build his own grip or delete a grip? Well, he can delete it just by un unhearting them up here. Um, but if he wants to build a new grip, we talked about earlier about the animation step. So step zero, we want them all to be open, um, and uh, step twenty, we want the, the the pinky, so the middle two to come to I don't know somewhere around the middle. Um, and then we'll add that, uh, and then you know, then we want the funds come across at step 40, we'll add that, and it'll build up, I've not finished building out this page, this is fairly uh, fairly new um, design because we're struggling to get it into the memory of the hands, um, but it'll add it on here, and then you click save, and it'll save it to the phone, and then down to handy later. And then we've got other things, like we can set the settings, uh, we can change the settings in the settings page, and a big warning saying, you know, you can damage it by changing them. Um, we've got muscle sensor check, so click start and it measures the muscle sensors and Caden can open and close his hand um, uh, in the different sequences and it saves these and then send for processing goes to Azure, to an Azure function where they can be looked at with machine learning to decide if uh, the, the sensors, uh, the values need to be changed in the, in the settings or not, which is in the settings page. So that's the mobile app. If I just quickly go back to um, oh, my um, slide deck. Um, I push all this up, so I do a uh, git push, push it up to my dev branches, I use App Center, which pushes down to uh, Caden's hand and his parents' phones as well, 
They're on the master branch. I'm on the dev branch that only pushes to me. I push those down. Uh, I'll push it up to cloud. It gets built for Android and iOS because they've got different phones in their houses and it gets pushed out to them. Um, when I'm happy and it's at a point where I'm happy to release, I'll then put it on the App Store. And it'll be a free of charge app for anyone that has one in their hands. Um, Azure uh, App Center is completely free. Um, uh, you have a paid for version, you want more build minutes, but trust me, most apps don't need that many build minutes um, in, unless you're uh, iterating very quickly um, on your, your pushes up. Um, you know, but you know, 240 minutes a month is more than enough for doing two or three minute builds uh, each time. So I've covered off the malware sensors, I've covered off the processor, I've covered off the grips, um, which is awesome. So I've now got a hand which caden has been using for a while. And um, you can see the actual motors, the two boards, the sensors, and a Xamarin app using Bluetooth. And the whole lot um, is come out at 430 pounds and 25 pence. Um, add in the springs and sensors, like I said earlier, 80 to 90 pound, I'm just over 500 pounds um, for full, um, arm with the sockets with the sensors and everything else um so i want to get it below 500 that's my target there's some corners i can cut here and there um which is where i'm aiming to to get at um in the uh, in the near future so for 500 pounds we've got an arm it's not the four or five thousand pounds and the um, finger parts and plastic because it's like five pounds they get broken we print another set so even for the nhs it's cheaper um than uh, than what they're currently building um, what's next? I realise I'm out of time. I'm a minute past the time. I wanted to go full drop now. I'm just going to really quickly uh, mention this. If you've not seen it before, uh, Wilderness Labs have got this Meadow F7 micro board. It's the same form factor other than that red box. So it's slightly longer board um, than the, the, the feather boards. Here's uh, um, the uh, Meadow board here and it runs .NET. So .NET Core runs on this board as it would on a, um, a Raspberry Pi or your laptop and um, it's got IoT and it's the same form factor. So the idea is I'm gonna move this into the back of the hand. Only problem is this doesn't have controllers or the libraries that were aid fruit wrote for the um, for the remote control board. So I'm gonna be Twitch streaming those over the next uh, few weeks and months about how I'm going to move the, um, those uh, Adafruit um, uh, libraries across to uh, the Feather and C Sharp. So what's out for me on, uh, on Twitch? And you can see me, I'll tweet about it when I'm gonna Twitch about it. So that gives us the meadow boards. Why did I mention being a pilot? I mentioned it earlier. I want to put all this into a box with a 3D printer, um, which is the one behind me. Um, all into a box. We have a couple of spools of filament and take it somewhere in the world um, and donate it to a, a hospital where the technicians and that can, uh, can look after people locally. So, and uh, really important, I want to say thank you to Caden. This project wouldn't be where it was without his help and his feedback, uh, positive and negative, and without the help from his family. And um, if you want to help out, open source um, Cliff Ages and Handy App, and you look, there'll also be Handy Arm, Handy Socket, which are all the 3D files. I'm not uh, ever close source this. It's always going to be open source, and I'm always happy to help anyone that's uh, building one of these for friends, family, or someone they know uh, locally, wherever they are in the world. That's enough for me. The screen's gone blank. I'm a few minutes over. Um, the uh, the, the uh, Slack channel is open if you want to uh, reach out with questions or hook me up on uh, Twitter or emails. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference. And come and see my Xamarin beginners talk if you've never used Xamarin. I'll be there tomorrow morning first thing. Thanks a lot. Bye.